وحاجه قومه قال أتحاجوني في الله وقد هدان ولا أخاف ما تشركون به إلا أن يشاء ربي شيئا وسع ربي كل شيء علما أفلا تتذكرون الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته I'm joined on the hot seat today by Sheikh Muhammad Timhambu حفظه الله وتعالى How you doing today? الحمد لله I'm very well جزاك الله خيرا Very well so we have a topic to discuss today, which is titled, Why are Muslims suffering? Mm. And as always on the hot seat, I like to start on a macro level and talk about the concept of suffering in general. So why does suffering exist in this world? So one of the most comprehensive ayat in which Allah Azza wa describes uh, the existence of suffering and the cause of it is the ayah in which Allah Azza wa Jal said, ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس ليذيقهم بعض الذي عملوا لعلهم يرجعون. Corruption has appeared on earth and at sea by what the hands of men have earned so that they may taste some of what they have done so that they may return. I return to Allah in repentance. So in this ayah, we actually have two things. We have the mention of the corruption and the evil which causes suffering on the earth and we have the reason or the wisdom behind it so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the cause of it and remember that there is a sabab and there is a musabib the cause of it is the actions of human beings what do you mean by sabab and musabib so here we have a cause and we have the one who ultimately is in control of that cause and brings it into effect the one in control of that cause and who brings it into effect is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one else. However, Allah azza wa jal places on this earth asbab, which are causes or means by which things happen. Uh, for example, the rain falling down. When the rain falls, there is a means by which that happens. There is a process scientifically by which that happens. But the one causing that process is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly here, Allah azza wa jal tells us that the evil which causes the suffering on this earth is the cause of that is people, it's human beings. Okay. But the one who is in control of that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here the most important thing is that Allah azza wa jal tells us the wisdom. And remember that Allah azza wa jal, and we should start with this as a, as a principle. In fact, if we start with two fundamental principles, because just as you like to start with the general question, I think uh, I like to start with, with a couple of principles. The first is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of everything. Okay. And the one who decrees everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your Lord, the one that there is no God worthy of worship, but Him, the creator of everything, so worship Him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمِن شَرِّي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مِن شَرِّي مَا خَلَقْ From the evil of what He created. So the, that's what we have to establish is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one creating and controlling everything that happens uh, in this universe. But these causes here, which we're talking about, are the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the reasons why things happen. And the second principle we want to start with is that the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that everything happens for an infinite wisdom. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Hikmatun baligah fama nudur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said infinite wisdom, uh, immeasurable wi wisdom, yet the warnings did not benefit them. So here, when we establish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a wisdom for things, here the wisdom that Allah azza wa jal mentions is so that we may taste some of what we have done. In reality, human beings don't taste the, 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 the evil of everything that they have done because if there was, there would not be anything good left on the earth. But human beings simply are given a taste of some of what will come to them if they do not turn in repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
so that they may return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one of the most comprehensive ayat. Add to that the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul mawt wa nabalukum bishari wal khayri fitna wa ilayna turja'oon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, every soul will taste death. And we test you with evil and good as a trial. And notice that Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned evil and good here. He didn't just mention the good. We test you with evil and good as a trial and to us you will be returned. And that is that this life is a test and a trial and a place where tests happen. And tests necessitate difficulties and hardship and suffering and problems as a means to test and to make known those who believe from those who don't. So that would be my overview. So I think that, that's a, uh, a very good overview. And it would be easier to accept your, your concept there if it was what I could see uh, happening in reality. So what I mean by that is that we know that um, if it's the case that this suffering happens as a result of our sins, we know that the non-Muslims are sinning far worse than us. They don't even believe in Allah. Mm. Yet when we look around the world, it's often the Muslim nations and the Muslims that are suffering even more than the non-Muslims. So how does that fit into mm. your paradigm that you just explained now? So here there are two answers to this. First of all, as a group of, as a collective group of Muslims, we have strayed very far away from the teachings of Islam that we were given. And if you remember that if we said that this is a way that Allah Azza wa Jal brings us back to him, then this Muslim nation in its current state is in desperate need of being brought back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from the wisdom of that is that necessitates that they would suffer in order that they would, would take this lesson and would come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the reality is that they have strayed very far away from the commands that Allah Azza wa Jal has given as an ummah collectively. And remember that Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Anfal, وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً Beware of a trial that will not afflict only the wrongdoers among you. That will not afflict only the wrongdoers among you. That there are some things that happen that because of the, the sins that exist within the, within the nation or the people as a whole, everybody becomes affected by them. And also the concept which the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in authentic hadith, in which he said about the severity of a person's, uh, the severity of a person's uh, trials. In he said that he said sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the severity of a person's uh, the severity of a person's trial or the greatness of a person's trial will be accompanied by the greatness of their reward. And we know the Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, لا تصيب المؤمن شوكة فما فوقها إلا قص الله به من خطيئته. That no believer is touched by even the prick of a thorn except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove some of their sins thereby. And when we talked about this hadith about the severity of a person's reward going along with the severity of the or the greatness of the reward that they get with the greatness of the punishment and the statement when Allah loves a people he tests them and the hadith is the hadith of Anas ibn Malik uh, and it's in Sunni ibn Majah and others Tirmidhi and others so here we see that Allah Azza wa Jal sometimes tests a people because he loves them and he wishes to erase the sins that they have so that doesn't so that's, that's something that could be quite difficult to understand. On one hand, mm. we're saying that Allah tests people because they're sinning against him and uh, and disobeying him. And on the other hand, we're saying that Allah tests people because he loves them. Does mm. he love the sinners? So here, first of all, uh, what we need here is we need to distinguish between these two cases. That Allah Azza wa Jal tested some people when we know that those people were not tested because of their sins. For example, the prophets, alayhim salatu salam. The prophets والسلام, were a people that had no major sins that were at the highest level of Allah's love for them and their love of Allah and were a people whose even minor sins were accidental mistakes and not deliberate attempts to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet none were tested greater than the prophets and the messengers. So here we have to separate these two things and say 
that it may be that Allah Azza wa Jal tests a person because of his love for them. Otherwise, there is no justification for the testing of the prophets and the messengers since they were the least of the people in sin. And yet they were the greatest of the people in tests and, tests and trials. And that brings you to, or that reminds you of a hadith that a man will be brought on the day of judgment and he will be, uh, he will be from the, from the, from the kuffar who were the, given the most blessings in this dunya. And he will be dipped into the fire. And then it will be said to him, did you ever know any blessings? And he will say, I didn't know, I didn't know of any. So from this, what we can understand is that a p the reverse of that being true, that a person comes and they were from the greatest of people in suffering in this world. And what happened was that that person on Yom Al-Qiyamah might be taken and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dips them into paradise and then says, did you know any suffering? And they say, I did not know any of any suffering. So when that is the case, we can here distinguish between two things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testing a person because of his love for them in order to raise their rank and in order to erase whatever sins they might have and to raise their rank. And that comes back to the hadith that we mentioned that a believer is not touched by the likes of a shawka of a, a thorn except that Allah erases some of their sins through it. And the cause of of the existence of problems and suffering in this world being the hands of men. Even the prophets and the messengers, والسلام, our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the suffering and the difficulties that he went with. Even when you look at those and you trace it back, you're still talking about the acts of people that cause suffering to other people. But the difference is how a person responds to that. So this is where some of the scholars said that if a person is responding in a positive way and that calamity is bringing them nearer to Allah, then this is closer that this is a way that Allah Azza wa is erasing their sins. And if it's the case that a person is behaving uh, and it's distancing them from Allah and it's making them doubt Allah and question Allah, then this is uh, closer to being a punishment through which they are told to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the reality is the issue is like all issues relating to Qadr, it is more complicated than that. It's more, it's more complex. And most people, apart from the prophets and the messengers, are a mix of both in reality. A believer, every believer has a share of Allah's love. There is no believer that Allah Azza wa Jal has, has no love for. But they also have sins and mistakes. And so when we bring these and balance these two things together, we see that these two things are not actually separate. They actually come together in, in the sense that Allah Azza wa Jal loves a person and wants to erase their sins and wants to raise their rank and at the same time a person has sins and mistakes that have brought about the calamities and likewise the other people around them like in the hadith of Zainab anha when she said anahrik uh, will we be destroyed when there are righteous people among us and the Prophet said Naami the kathar al khabath he said yes if the corruption in the society increases so I think when we look at these from two separate angles we can uh, reconcile between the two and see that in many you do get cases where it's nothing but punishment because that person has no love Allah has no love for them at all like the most you know wicked of people and you have a case where it is purely uh, a means to raise their rank like the prophets and the messengers والسلام, but the average person lies in between that so both of those causes come into effect so you mentioned the hadith there that talks about that some people could suffer as a result, not necessarily through their own sins, but the sins of their nation or the Muslims at large. That brings me on to my next question, which is mm. how is that fair and just of Allah to do? Doesn't mm. Allah say, Wala taziru waziratun wizla ukhra, that nobody mm. will bear a, a burden for someone else? You have countries now that are going through a lot of suffering. Are we saying that there's not one righteous person in there? Mm. Why, why is he suffering as because of the results of someone mm. else's sins? So here we have... Uh, two, we have an ayah, we have a hadith which explain this very, very well. We have an ayah in which Allah said, khasa. Be aware of a, of a trial that will come that will not only afflict the wrongdoers among you. So this tells us that there are some things that if the situation reaches such a level of corruption that the punishment may descend upon everyone the righteous and the wicked. However, we have a hadith which explains the justice within it. And this hadith is the hadith of Aisha 
رضي الله عنها and it's actually a, an issue that Aisha raised that same issue that you're raising now Aisha raised that same issue because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned about a people who would go out uh, an army that would go out to destroy the Kaaba and the army as they are traveling to destroy the Kaaba they would be destroyed the earth would uh, would swallow them up and they would be sunk into the earth Aisha رضي الله عنها she said قلنا يا رسول الله إن الطريق قد يجمع الناس the road will likely have many different people on the same road. Generally, when the armies go, you'd have people buying and selling to the soldiers. You'd have people who were just walking on the same road. You'd have people who were crossing the path. So she said, The road will bring lots of people together. So how can it be that the all of them will be sunk in the road when some of them are just crossing the road to go to somewhere else? قال, the Prophet said, yes. And then he said uh, the, different, the different people that would be on the road. He mentioned that there were people who would be come with, with Al-Mustabsir, the one who is really knows what they're doing. They, they can clearly see what they're doing. Well, Majbur, the one that was being forced along. They were a slave. They were being dragged by the army and it was not their choice to be. Wabin is sabil and the person who was just a traveler on the road who was cut off just trying to get some uh, maybe charity or get some way to reach their home. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, يَهْلِكُونَ مَهْلَكًا وَاحِدًا They will all be destroyed with a single destruction. But then he said, وَيَسْتُرُونَ مَصَادِرَ شَتَّى يَبَعَثُهُمُ اللَّهِ عَلَى نِيَّتِهِمْ But when they are raised on the Day of Judgment, each one of them will be raised in a totally different way. Allah will raise them according to their intentions. So here we see that generally the case is that the punishment falls upon the wrongdoer. But if it's the case that a punishment is so great that it affects more than just the wrongdoers, then on the day of judgment, Allah Azza wa Jal will resurrect people according to their intention. And He will not resurrect the one that was simply crossing the road the same way that He will resurrect the one that is uh, going with the intention of destroying the Kaaba. Rather, each one will be resurrected according to their intention. Now, here I think it's very important, very important that we bear in mind the temporary nature of this life. Because many of these arguments that come forward about suffering come forward within a context that this life is your goal and your only, uh, the only thing that you're here for and, it, and whatever you get in this life, that's all you're going to get. And when you think of it like that, it's impossible to contextualize suffering. You can't possibly put suffering into context if you are thinking of this life as the end game. Whereas when you see that you that there is a life which is to come and that this life is so insignificant that a person will not even remember what they went through in this life, then you see that the important thing is what happens to you Yom al Qiyamah. And that if there are things that happen to people in this world that are that deny or that cause them to be denied opportunities, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make that uh, just and will make it fair Yawm Al-Qiyamah and will balance it out Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Okay. How would you respond to someone who says that the, the mass suffering that the Muslims are currently undertaking across the world is an indication that Islam cannot be the true religion? Because Allah simply wouldn't do this to the people he loves, even with regards to the benefit in the hereafter and contextualizing mm. suffering with the akhirah. Still, to do this, a loving God, would he really do this to people that he loves? Mm. So I think here again, we need to go back to some key uh, principles. First of all, we look at the prophets and the messengers, alayhim Here we have a people that it is guaranteed, cast iron guarantee, and you and I both agree, as does everyone watching this at home, agrees that those people were beloved to Allah. Even those from who, uh, for example, from Ahl Kitab, and then you look at you look at the example of Musa, you look at the example of Isa, alayhim uh, salatu salam. All of us agree unanimously that those were righteous people, yeah. and yet they suffered. Ayub suffered to the extent that he said, "Masani wa ahli al-tur." I've been, me and my family have been touched by an affliction. Yaqub suffered until the point where he said, "Inna ma ashku bathi wa huzni ilallah." I only complained of my grief and sorrow to Allah. Uh, Yunus called out, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-dhalimeen. 
الله عز وجل سر فاستجبنا له ونجيناه من الغم وكذلك ننجي المؤمنين الله عز وجل saved him from his distress the severe distress that, that Yunus was uh, suffering our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam suffered more than any of the other prophets and messengers alayhim, alayhim he suffered more than any of them and yet these are all people that Allah Azza wa Jal loves the thing that people have to understand is that when it comes to the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal there is a difference between what Allah decrees and what Allah loves Allah Azza wa Jal only loves that which is good and he only loves uh, for good to happen and good to be done but Allah Azza wa Jal decrees for many things to happen that he doesn't love for a wisdom that remains with him Shaykh Al-Islam of Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala said something very profound about this which I believe is, is relevant and important for people to understand he said and I'll just paraphrase it was a quote quite long but what he said is that just as you recognize that Allah's attributes are perfect but you don't understand the way those attributes work Likewise, you recognize that his wisdom is perfect, even if you don't understand all of the tafasil, the, the details of a particular event and why that wisdom exists. So, for example, we accept that Allah is Samir and Basir, that Allah is Ajal, hears everything and sees everything. But we don't understand how Allah hears and sees everything. For us, we can't comprehend how it is that Allah is Ajal, can see everything because our sight is limited. We can't comprehend how it is that Allah hears everything because if we hear two, three, four different voices, they become all mixed up and we get confused and we can't concentrate. So how is it that Allah can hear billions upon billions upon billions of different sounds and voices all simultaneously and not confuse them? Yet we recognize that it's true. The same thing, you can't distinguish between that and between Allah's wisdom. That if you recognize that Allah has infinite wisdom, hikmatun baliga fama in nudur infinite and immeasurable wisdom the details of that wisdom you can't fully have the in every event now that doesn't mean because one person doesn't understand the wisdom the other one doesn't rather some people will explain a wisdom behind things and sometimes you won't understand a wisdom when it happens to you but you'll understand that wisdom many years later so for example somebody gets into a a car crash or something like that and he says that you know i I don't know why this happened to me. I was praying. I was good. I was making dua to Allah. I did my adhkar and then this happened and I can't understand it. And then they see within a set number of months that something happened to them that that was one of the biggest blessings Allah gave them. It just, But they couldn't see that at the time until later on. So seeing the details of a wisdom behind any particular situation may or may not be possible for you. But recognizing that that wisdom exists is an obligation upon every Muslim. Now we've also said that Allah tests people because he loves them. And we've also said that the situation of the Muslims today is a situation in which the Muslims are in need of returning to Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna Allah la ma bi qawmin hatta ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is with themselves. The Prophet spoke about how this nation would be at the end of time. And he spoke about how the non-Muslims would gather together around the Muslims like the, you know, the prey gathers around the game. And yet with all of those things, he explained that it was not because of the low number of the Muslims, but that their deeds were like the form of the sea. And if that is said, then you can understand that the situation the Muslims are in today is one where collectively as a nation, we have strayed from the path of Allah Azza wa Jal very far. And if Allah Azza wa Jal loves us like we hope that He loves us, He'll bring us back. For Him, His Sunnah, the Sunnah of Allah, you're not going to find a difference in the way that Allah deals with people, is that Allah brings you back by testing you. Allah doesn't bring you back by opening the dunya. In fact, opening the dunya is something that Allah Azza wa Jal typically does for the non Muslims. And to the point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how he opens up the dunya for them. Uh, and then he says, uh, Allah Azza wa Jalla said, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبَوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى إِذَا فَرِحُوا بِمَا أُوتُوا أَخَذْنَاهُمْ بَغْتَةً فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْلِسُونَ Allah Azza wa Jalla said, when they forgot what they were reminded of, 
we opened up for them the doors of every good. Then when they were happy with what they were given, we, we, took, we struck them with a calamity suddenly. And then they were cut off from all chances to change and, and, and all chances to correct themselves. So if Allah Azza loves the Muslims, surely that necessitates that Allah brings them back to their deen. And Allah brings them back by making them suffer and making them have hardships and difficulties. In fact, the opposite is true of the people that Allah doesn't love. He opens for them the dunya and then Allah Azza wa takes their souls. Allah takes their souls while they are in a state of disbelief. So this is actually a blessing for the Muslims that Allah Azza wa gives them the reminder that brings them back. Furthermore, if we look at the the, the way that Allah Azza wa dealt with Ahlul Kitab Why are we told so much about Ahlul Kitab in the Quran? Because Ahlul Kitab are an example of what we will go through You're going to follow the ways of the people who came before you That being said, Ahlul Kitab went through the same things When they strayed away from Allah Azza wa Jal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them tests and trials in the beginning of Surah Al-Isra, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions how that happened to uh, Bani Israel. ثُمَّ رَدَدَنَا لَكُمْ الْكَرَّةَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَمْدَدَنَا لَكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَجَعَلْنَا لَكُمْ أَكْثَرَ نَفِيرًا إِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُمْ فَلَهَا Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned that when we gave you then the, uh, the chance or we gave you again another opportunity. So they lost, the, the enemies uh, went and they destroyed their place of worship, then Allah Azza wa gave them another opportunity and He gave them wealth and He gave them children and He made them strong. Then again, if you are good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will maintain that for you. And if you turn away, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take away from you. And Allah said, وَإِنْ عُدْتُمْ عُدْنَا فَإِنْ عُدْتُمْ عُدْنَا If you go back to how you were, then we will go back to the same thing will happen to you again. So this is also the sunnah of Ahl Kitab, the same thing that Ahl Kitab went through as well. So it's not something that we should be surprised by as Muslims, but it's something that should make us wake up and turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of those ways of waking up and turning back to Allah is, as you said, stopping and decreasing the number of sins that we do. And when I think of sins, I'm thinking about drinking alcohol, committing zina. I've seen a lot of your lectures and you talk a lot about tawheed and, and uh, worshipping Allah alone. Why can't we deal with the sins right now? Why can't we deal with the sins of zina and alcohol? Surely that's the thing that we need to be addressing in order to uplift the suffering that we're currently going through. Mm. There's no doubt that we need to be addressing all of the sins that, that are taking place in the Muslim Ummah today. But the greatest sin is the one that Allah Azza wa Jal said about it. Inna Allah la yaghfiru Allah does not forgive that you make a partner with him and he forgives anything less than that for whoever he wills. So this tells us that the greatest sin and the Prophet ﷺ was asked about the greatest sin. And he said, That you make a partner with Allah while Allah is the one who created you. So here, if you look at the, the way that the Qur'an deals with this, it's incorrect to say that the Qur'an doesn't deal with sins like uh, alcohol and zina. Rather, if you look at the wasiyah that of... of uh, in fact, I'm going to mention, I'm going to bring the whole thing for one second because it's better to bring the whole one. <laughs> if you look at the wasiyah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is mentioned in the Quran. And that is in the end of Surah Al-An'am, it's about ayah number 151 onwards, that Allah Azza wa Jal said, قُلْ تَعَالَوْ أَتْلُ مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ لَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ مِنْ إِمْلَاقٍ نَحْنُ نَرْزُخُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الْفَوَاحِشَ مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطَنْ وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا مَالَ الْيَتِيمِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ حَتَّى يَبْلُغَ أَشُدَّهُ وَأَوْفُوا 
وأوفوا الكيل والميزان بالقسط لا ت... لا نكلف نفسا إلا وسعها وإذا قلتم فاعدلوا ولو كان ذا قربى وبعهد الله أوفوا ذلكم وصاكم به لعلكم تذكرون وأن هذا صراط مستقيما فاتبعوه ولا تتبعوا السبل فتفرق بكم عن سبيله ذلكم وصاكم به لعلكم تتقون This is the final wasiyah of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم which mentions the sins that we've been commanded to keep away from. Say, come and I will recite to you what your Lord has made haram for you, that you do not make a partner with him, and that you be good to your parents, and that you do not kill your children out of a fear of poverty. We will provide for you and for them. And do not go near to immorality, such as zina, that which is apparent and that which is hidden. And don't kill a person that Allah has made forbidden for you except without the due right. That is what Allah com- advises you or commands you with so that you, may ref- so that you may take thought. And do not come close to the wealth of the orphan until, except with that which is good until he reaches the age of maturity. And, be, and, f- and uh, give full measure with, the, with the, the measures of volume and the measures of weight in justice. We do not burden a soul except with what it, w- what it can bear. And if you speak, then speak with justice, even though it is, even if it is against a near relative. And fulfill the commands of Allah, or fulfill your promises to Allah. That is what Allah commands you with, so that you may take, so that you may remember. And this is this, and this is my straight path. So follow it, and do not follow the other path, so they take you away from His path. This is what Allah commands you with, so that you may be a people of taqwa. This is the final advice of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said that this is that that's that is what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi left you with. And if you notice, the first thing that is said is a shirk, to keep away from making a partner with Allah. But nor is it neglected to keep away from zina and killing and all of the other fawahish, including alcohol and whatever, which are mentioned in the ayah. But the first thing is to sort out a person's heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ultimately, if our relationship with Allah is broken, our relationship with ourselves in our communities, with our families is going to be fundamentally broken. So it's not that we sit here telling people that we shouldn't be dealing with Muslims drinking alcohol or we shouldn't be dealing with Muslims committing zina, but we shouldn't be neglecting the very first thing that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, which is that we don't make a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, you've very nicely explained a lot of the wisdoms behind the suffering that exists, particularly for the Muslims. At the same time, we are working continuously to uplift the suffering, to help our brothers and sisters around the world. And one of the things we do on, on a very regular basis is dua. Every single Ramadan, Salat al-Tarawih, the Imam makes dua for almost every single Muslim nation that is undergoing suffering at that time. This has been happening for years and years and years. And Allah says in the Quran, Ujibu da'wat al-da'i ida da'an. I will answer the the call of the caller when he calls. We've been calling for years and it's not mm. come yet. Why? So let me bring you back again to the story or the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You could argue that we as Muslims, our dua, you know, we have mawani' things that stop our dua from being accepted. Like the hadith about ثُمَّ ذَكَرَ رَجُلًا يُطِيلُ السَّفَرُ أَشْعَثَ أَغْبَرْ يَمُدُّ يَدَيْهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ يَقُولُ يَا رَبِّ يَا رَبِّ That the, this man on a long journey and he's dusty and disheveled and he raises his hands to the sky and he says, My Lord, my Lord, but his food is haram and his drink is haram, his clothing is haram and he's nourished with haram. فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لِذَلِكْ How is Allah going to answer him? You could argue that that is one of the reasons why we as Muslims, our situation is not being uplifted. And we mentioned the ayah, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is with themselves. But I want to take it from a different angle. Okay. Look at the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, his dua was mustajab. Yeah. To the point that you can count the times when Allah didn't give him something you can count them like th- that he said, Allah answered my dua except for one thing that he didn't answer. I-, I asked Allah for three things. He gave me two of them and he prevented me from one of them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was someone whose dua was answered. And yet, if you look at his situation for, for 13 years in Mecca and he was in a state of being oppressed, being uh, in, enduring incredible suffering along with the, the, the Muslims who were there, you look at what happened to the family of Yasir when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to them, Sabran ala Yasir fa'inna mawidukum, fa'inna mawidakum al-jannah. Be patient, O, P- o family of Yasir, because your final destination is Jannah. 
and the martyrdom of Sumayya radiallahu anha and all of the things that happened to the Muslims in Mecca and yet all that time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was making dua in Medina the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua sometimes the Muslims were victorious sometimes not and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala told us about this in multiple ayat in the Quran Allah Azza wa Jalla said am hasibatum an tadkhulu al janna wa lamma ya'tikum mathalu alladhina khalaw min qablikum massathum al ba'sa wa al darra wa zulzilu hatta yaqula al rasul wal ladhina amanu ma'ahu mata nasrullah ala inna nasrullah qareeb do you believe that you will enter paradise when there has not yet come to you the likes of what came to the people before you they were touched with such hardship and adversity and and shaken so badly that even their messenger and those who believed along with him would say, when is the help of Allah going to come? Indeed, the help of Allah is near. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, إِنْ يَمْسَسْكُمْ قَرْحٌ فَقَدْ مَسَّ الْقَوْمَ قَرْحٌ مِثْلُهُ وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ وَلِيَعْلَمُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يَتَّقِذَ مِنْكُمْ شُهَدَاء وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah said, if you are touched with a wound, then these people have been touched with a wound like yours. And in these days, we rotate between the people. I, we give you victory sometimes and sometimes we don't. So that Allah may know those who believe. I, so that Allah may, may make known those who believe. May make the people know who those who believe. And may take from among you martyrs. And Allah does not love the oppressive. So what you can take from this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delayed the answer of the answering of that dua of his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for victory. Even though that the Prophet ﷺ had been making dua for the Muslims since the first day that he was sent by Allah Azza wa Jal, until the better part of 23 years, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the victory right at the very end of the time of his prophethood. That victory came right at the end, certainly after the 10th year after the Hijrah, you're talking about somewhere in the region of 20 to 23 years before the Prophet ﷺ was given that victory. And if that's someone whom Allah loves and answers their dua, then it shows that there are times your duas may be delayed in being answered for a reason. They may be delayed in being answered because there is a greater wisdom in that, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes some people to be taken as martyrs and to be raised in rank in paradise, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to test the people. If your dua was answered every single time, instantly that you made dua, there would be no test. That's the reality of it. Add to that all of the problems that exist within the Muslim Ummah today. The distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sins, the problems that are happening, the lack of, uh, of, of religion, of prayer, abandoning of the prayer. That's only an extra reason to add to the fact that our dua is not being uh, answered. And then you add to that as well what the Prophet ﷺ said, Na'mi, the kathur al-khabath, when corruption and, and filth becomes widespread, Despite our dua, still the corruption among the Muslims and the, and the evil practices among the Muslims remain widespread. And Allah promised that he will not change the condition of a people until they change what is with themselves. So when we put all these things together, we say that first of all, your dua may be delayed for a wisdom that is with Allah Azza wa Jal, as the Prophet Sallallahu dua was delayed in this until the conquest of Makkah. And what we are required is to be, is to be patient. الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا إن لله وإن إليه راجعون. Those people who, when they're touched by a calamity, they say we belong to indeed we belong to Allah and to Him we will return. أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المهتدون. Those are the people who the, the, the that Allah subhanahu wa taala's blessings are upon and that they are the ones who are rightly guided. They are patient when they're when they're afflicted by a trial. So ultimately, that concept of patience comes from that delay that happens. But also we have yet to remove the causes which are blocking our dua from being answered as well. So these things come together and, and provide a comprehensive answer as to why we're still in the same situation. But they also tell us that the answer is not to stop making dua. The answer is to continue making dua, to continue being patient and for each individual to strive to remove whatever they can from the things that are stopping their dua from being accepted. And when that collective process happens, like it happened to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in Mecca, and more and more became Muslim, and then they went to Medina, and the, the situation improved for them, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change the condition of the Muslims. But He will only change that condition when each one of us strives to correct what they can uh, from the reasons why our own dua might not be 
uh, accepted. Is that really realistic though, Ustad? Are you really going to get it to a point where Muslims across the world, there's so many of us and there's so many with different, all kinds of different yeah. sins. I mean, I'm only really can control what I do. Are you really going to get to the point where the Muslims in totality are like the Sahaba, like you mentioned, all upright, righteous? I seem like an impossibility right now. There is nothing that is difficult for Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ala kulli shayin qadir, able to do all things. What is for us is not to worry about what we can't control. The concept of tawakkul is not to worry about what you can't control. The concept is to worry about what I can control. I can't control what someone is doing on the other side of the world. But I can control what I'm doing. And I can be a person who goes and tries to make positive changes around myself, my family, my neighbors and so on. And look at what Imam Malik said. That this ummah will not be, the latter part of this ummah will not be corrected except by what corrected the former part of it. Those Sahaba looked at it like it was an impossible task. In Makkah, you know, you're a handful of people. You have no power. You have no control. And you are mustada'afeen. You're in a state of extremely, being extremely oppressed. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took them out of that situation by His blessing and His mercy. And that can happen to the Muslims today as long as the Muslims follow the same methodology that they followed, which is each person corrects themselves and those around them and works to correct their family, their friends, their social you know, uh, circle, their neighbors, you know, their, their, their localities and so on. And the more efforts are made like that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring about for this ummah something, a situation which will correct the uh, the situation or the correct the problems that exist within it it's not an impossibility for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but each one of us needs to worry about what we can change and not become defeatist like the prophet sallallahu said ihris ala ma yanfa'uk wasta'in billah wa la ta'jiz he said be keen to to do what will benefit you and seek the help of Allah but don't be defeatist. Don't say that it will never happen. It's never going to change. We can never improve the situation. And in fact, Allah Azza wa Jal has told us through the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that this situation will change. Because before the end of time, we know from the events that will happen before the Qiyamah is that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will bring about a correction among the Muslims uh, at the time of the uh, Dajjal and the Mahdi and so on. So it's not really realistic for us to say that this is never going to change, but to simply say that we are going to be judged on our individual efforts as what we did to help to bring about that change and not on the collective situation of the Muslims. Because as you rightly said, we're not going to be carrying the burden of somebody else. But my own burden is what did I do for myself, my family, my neighbors, my friends, my social circle, my local community to change the situation. And then Allah is the one who will uh, guide the Muslims to be able to change the rest. Okay, in addition to dua and in addition to correcting ourselves and refraining from sins, I have another solution. And I'm now I'm talking about the suffering, not necessarily from the natural disasters like earthquakes, but mm. I'm certainly talking about the suffering that comes from the disbelievers and the oppression that's taking place in the Muslim lands. Why don't we all just come together and unite? I mm. understand we have differences in certain areas of belief. Isn't it time to just put that to the side? Come together as one united body, large in number. Isn't mm. Allah going to help us if we're all together working towards the same cause? See here, uh, this argument about the Muslims uh, becoming united, this in itself has a, is correct in a way and it has some areas in which people make mistakes. So Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا Allah said, obey Allah and his messenger and do not differ. So you, if you do, you will fail and your strength will go and be patient. Indeed, Allah is with those who are patient. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms that if we uh, are divided and disunited, that will cause our strength to go and it will cause us to lose our uh, what we want for this nation and it will cause us to lose our aims and our goals but when we understand when Allah said about this tanazur, this differing 
Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned this differing in another ayah. He said, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul wa uli al-amri minkum. Fa in tanaza'atum fi shay'in farudduhu ila Allah wa al-Rasul in kuntum tu'minuna billahi wal-yawm al-akhir. Thalika khayrun wa ahsanu ta'wila. O you who believe, obey Allah and obey his messenger and those in authority over you. And if you differ in something, the same word differing, to the best of my knowledge, the only time that word is used in two places. Once about being united and not differing, and here. And if you differ in something, return it back to Allah and his messenger. So when we combine these two ayat, it's the unity upon the Quran and the Sunnah which will bring strength to the Muslims. Because the two, remember, the Quran doesn't contradict itself. And here, this tanazur is mentioned in two places. It's mentioned once uh, in Surah An-Nisa, once in Surah Al-Anfal, if I'm not mistaken. In Surah Al-Anfal, Allah Azza wa tells us that this tanazur, this argumentation differing from each other, is going to cause us to lose our strength and to fail in our objectives. In Surah An-Nisa, Allah Azza wa tells us that this tanazur and this Argumentation has to be brought back to the Quran and the Sunnah. For us to unite upon anything else is simply not going to work. And Allah Azza wa tells us it won't work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Law anfaqta ma fil ardi jami'an ma alafta bayna kulubihim walakin Allah alafa baynahum. Allah Azza wa said, if I if you spent everything on the earth to bring their hearts together, you would not be able to bring their hearts together. But Allah brought their hearts together. If you look at the even the Ansar among themselves, the Aus and the Khazraj, used to be fighting with each other. The Muhajireen and the Ansar and all the different tribes. What brought them together? You can't bring them together on some political objective, on some, you know, let's all just work together for a common cause type of thing. You can't bring them together with money. You can't bring them together with bribery and promises. The thing which brings them together is فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ Bring it back to Allah and His Messenger. And that is a basis upon which you can unite. Because as you know, to, to unite anything, you have to have a common basis upon which to unite. And in reality, there is no common basis. There is to uplift the suffering from the Muslims. That's the common ground. That common ground doesn't work as Allah told us, as we said. You can't bring their hearts together. They saw the suffering of the Muslims, but the Prophet ﷺ could not bring their hearts together except with the Book of Allah and with the Sunnah of the Messenger ﷺ. Well, we don't necessarily have to be together to, to work together. Mm. I go to work and certainly in my company, there are non-Muslims, there are people who believe all kinds of different things, but ultimately we're working towards the same objective. We're working towards the benefit of the company as a whole. But the dunya is not the same as the religion, right? And Allah Azza wa Jal here, He told us very specifically that this tanazur, it has to be brought back to the kitab and the sunnah. Furthermore, if that's not enough of an argument, the argument that Allah Azza wa Jal told us that we have to bring it back to the Quran and the sunnah, and that the only way we can unite with each other is to unite with each other upon the Quran and the sunnah, then history is enough of a teacher that if you look at the historical context of Muslims uniting together without that basis of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, it doesn't work. It has never worked. Historically, time and time again, there have been calls to unite the Muslims. But the reality is when those differences are so big, and remember those differences are differences in Islam. And this is the difference when you mentioned the example of the company. The workers are united on the basis of the vision and the mission of the company. But here, the people of these, these Muslims who are trying to come together are not united upon the basis of the vision and mission of Islam. They actually differ over that core concept. And so when you bring people back to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, that is when you are able to build brotherhood between people. Now that doesn't mean that you sometimes can't also, to be fair, that you can't always cooperate with other people. That there are many situations in which we can cooperate, be it with non-Muslims, be it with Muslims that we differ from, However, the Sharia has very limited examples for that. It's not the case, and it's a wrong it's 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 a wrong concept to say that they can never ever ever you know you can never ever have a situation where you would need to cooperate with someone who differs on your principles of the Quran and the Sunnah. That's not the case. And in fact, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he went to Medina, the agreement that he made between the people of Medina, the agreement that he made in Makkah with Quraysh prior to Islam. 
the, uh, the 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 contract where they came together to support the 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 rights of the weak and the needy and so on this is something possible however this is only ever going to be in a limited context it's only ever going to be for one particular issue or one particular limited context it's never going to be something which is going to completely change the condition of the muslims because allah as we said in allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves so yes if there is let's say for example a famine somewhere it is possible for people to cooperate with each other to relieve that famine who are not together on the same belief or the same principles or perhaps even the same religion but ultimately the situation of the muslims in the world today across the ummah of islam is only going to change as allah azza wa jal told us walakinna allah allafa baynahum it was allah who brought them together farudduhu ila allah wa rasul return it back to allah and his messenger and so on that's what's going to bring and like imam malik said the latter part of this ummah will only be corrected by the same thing that corrected the former part on a, on a, on the scale of the ummah as a whole. Okay. Jazakallah khairan. I just want yeah. to close out the episode with some final piece of advice. So again, we'll start at the macro level and it might be a kind of a summary of what you've already repeated mm-hmm. throughout the episode. On a macro general level, what kind of advice would you give to the Muslims in general to uplift the suffering from the ummah? First of all, I think that we're going to take this from two separate angles. The level of the individual towards themselves and then the then what you can do towards other people so first of all for your own self a person needs to realize that if allah azza wa jal mentioned one of the major causes if not the major cause of calamities happening to people is sins then our obligation is to remove ignorance from ourselves and other people and ignorance is what causes us to sin because if we were not ignorant we wouldn't sin ignorance is the is the essence of what causes ignorance about allah ignorance about the consequences ignorance about yawm al qiyamah ignorance about the, the what allah deserves in terms of worship and obedience so when we know allah azza wa jalla as he deserves to be known and we know our religion that reduces the ignorance from ourselves and we can become closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this will be our little part to correct the calamities that are happening on a personal level then the next thing is for us to do that by dealing with the people that are closest to us so that could be our family members and i mean how many times have we heard for example the argument that you know the muslims in this country need to change xyz and yet that person who makes the argument if they were to le- look at their own house they would see that those issues haven't been corrected in their own living room so how can we possibly then be complaining that this place or that place hasn't done 1 2 3 4 5 5 when in reality that person hasn't began doing it in their own living room then the second aspect is what that person is going to do for those people who are suffering and that is that we are required to do everything permissible that is within our means to relieve the situation of the muslims wherever they are that could be through sadaqa uh, that could be through dua that could be through physical help where that is possible to do and permitted to do uh, depending on the situation but we are commanded to go it's not for us to sit there and say well i'm busy correcting my family i, ha- I haven't got time for the people in this country or that country reality is that we have to balance ourselves but if we ignore the need to correct ourselves and our situation we won't actually make an impact on helping those other people so we correct ourselves we correct our families and whatever we have that's within our ability that we can stand yawm al qiyamah and say oh allah i did whatever i had the ability to do to help my muslim brothers and sisters that are suffering in different places and that i was uh, the minimum that someone can do is at least make dua for them uh, and again supporting them through uh, reliable uh, charity uh, efforts and so on this is also i think extremely important to to begin with uh, from the individual and their families and then their like th- their responsibility towards people who are suffering elsewhere okay final question now is more talking about an individual what is your advice to an individual who just feels like their life is just one big struggle they're just going from one calamity to another calamity to another calamity and they can't see any light at the end of the tunnel it's just constant suffering 
So I think there are two uh, very important things here. I think, first of all, we have to remember that this life is a place of tests and trials. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kullu nafsin mawt. Every soul will taste death. And we're going to test you with evil and with good as a trial. And you're going to be returned to us. Now, a person's, the tests and trials that they're going through, they're either going to do one of two things. Either they're going to bring you back to Allah Azza wa Jal, or they're going to distance you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those tests and trials happening, you can't change. You can't change what Allah has decreed for you. But you can either take advantage of them as a way to get nearer to Allah, like Ayyub did, like Yunus did, like Yaqub did. Or you can distance yourself and make yourself someone who's distanced, becoming more and more distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلِيَعْضُ billah. And that is something which is really a, the true punishment. The true punishment is not really being tested and suffering. The true punishment is not using that suffering to get nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by reading the seerah of the people who came before, the, of the prophets, the messengers, the imams of Islam who suffered, it relieves your suffering because it makes you put it into context and realize that I can get through this. Ultimately, it's also really important to remember that suffering as much as a person is suffering and as great as those calamities are, the person is not without blessings. And that's why a, a slave of Allah is always between sabr or shukr, between patience and gratitude. There are always going to be things. The fact that you can even think about your suffering and turn to Allah is a huge blessing. So there will always be blessings for that person and there will always be things that they need to be patient with. So we also need to remember that there is always ease. Ease always comes. Uh, that Allah just said, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى Along with all hardship comes ease. Along with hardship comes ease. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that w along with uh, the difficulties and the hardships comes ease. And along with the suffering comes relief and so on. So I think that a person needs to understand that the relief will come they need to take advantage of the situation that they are in right now and to get the most out of it that they can. And they need to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve that suffering and read the biographies and the books of the people who came before to make that easier to bear. Yeah. It's been a pleasure having you on the show as yeah, always. Okay. I hope inshallah you'll join me again. Until next time, jazakallah khairun for your time today. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.